Hi folks, uh, this is Dr. Rob Sivas, the Carb Addiction Doc, and today I am going to do this video about a prediction. As the, the cogs of the wheels in my head have turned, as I've been watching and listening to people and looking at the way uh, that the tide of nutritional misinformation has changed, um, I've come up with a, with a statement and I'm hesitating a little bit because it is an incredibly powerful statement. In this video, I'm going to make a prediction of the next genocide of misinformation that the drug companies are going to pull the wool over on our eyes about to sell us medication that doesn't work and doesn't fix the problem. And this is directed at the people that manufacture anti-lipid medications. So more and more and more, I think it's becoming increasingly common knowledge, and you've got to stick your head deeper and deeper into the sand to ignore the fact that the multi-trillion dollar business of selling statins as a goal to reduce LDL, not, not to reduce heart attacks and stroke rates, because they don't, but to reduce LDL is really a comprehensive myth that has very, very little evidence to support its validity, as is the fact that saturated fat is harmful. And I quote there the College of Cardiology uh, 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 statement review or, or review article that was published by them in May of 2020. However, more and more evidence, both biologically as well as outcomes data, supports the fact that for people at risk of cardiovascular events, there really is no benefit to taking a statin and potentially liability because of the statin uh, um, side effects. And even as a, a drug to treat people who've got cardiovascular disease, who've had a heart attack, the benefits of taking a statin are close to zero or just slightly off of zero. But the cost and the side effects don't warrant the prescription of those drugs to everybody, their aunts and uncles and sons and daughters. So more and more, the drug companies are seeing that writing on the wall. And while they're not talking about it, they're still pushing statins to everybody. They're already looking at next gen, just like the tobacco companies went from tobacco, saw the writing on the wall uh, with all the lawsuits against big tobacco. And now they have condemned smoking, but they're selling Juul and they're selling uh, vaping products like crazy more than they ever sold cigarettes. Well, the lipid drug companies are going to do the same thing. Here's my prediction. They're going to shift their focus of demonizing LDL as the cause of heart attacks and strokes and demonizing uh, um, saturated fat and LDL. They're not going to say they were wrong. They're not going to make an excuse or, or acknowledge their mistake. They're just subtly going to shift, and it's already happening, folks. They're going to shift to treating a far more predictable marker of cardiovascular disease. Now note those words, a far more predictable marker, 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 not cause, of cardiovascular disease, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, and embolic strokes. And that is triglycerides. And they are going to have huge campaigns to try to convince us that elevated triglycerides cause heart attacks and strokes. And if you've watched any of my videos, you know how obsessed I am with the difference in the words of associations, cause, and assumptions. So the next big prediction for me is that the drug companies over the next five to 10 years are gonna focus very, very heavily on advertising against triglycerides. And if your triglycerides are slightly elevated, you have to, have to, have to take one of their expensive medications. Right now, the drug they're pushing is a drug called Vicepa, which is just an alcohol form, an ethyl form of EPA, an icosanoid. It's a three omega fatty acid that we kind of find in fish, not in the concentrations they're putting into a pill, but they're selling us 
fish oil that is ridiculously expensive and they their targeting message is that this drug will reduce your triglycerides and triglycerides cause heart attacks and strokes of course so do ldl so does ldl but now we've really found the thing that matters that's going to be their message we know that there's there's cross reactivity or reduction in triglyceride numbers with drugs like uh, niacin uh, certain of the statins, statins, and then phenofibrate. The fibrates are also a drug that lower tri, uh, triglycerides floating free in the blood. And my prediction is the drug company is going to focus very heavily on that because they now have a drug to treat something floating around our, in our bloodstream that God and nature put in there by mistake one day. God and nature weren't looking. They put triglycerides in our blood and suddenly we all became sick and died. And the reason I call it a genocide of misinformation is because they base their information on a bunch of experts saying it is so, because they don't have proof. They have linkage, they have association proof. Higher your triglycerides are, the higher your risk of cardiovascular disease, absolutely. But the triglycerides, like the LDL, do, does not and do not cause that problem. They're responding to something that caused the problem. So we're going to go down the road of exploring this because it's so, so, so important in atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. That snot-like substance, that gelatin that builds up in your blood vessels. The question really is, why does that stuff build up? Why does that gelatinous fatty material build up, and it is not because of triglycerides, folks. But if you correlate triglycerides with cardiovascular disease and strokes, of course, the higher the triglycerides are, the more risk you are. So, aha, must be causal. Must be causal. It is not. And they are going to kill or allow millions of more of people throughout the world to die as they treated LDL with statins that weren't effective, and we now have strong evidence that they're not, uh, they're now going to do exactly the same thing with triglycerides. So the way I look at it is this way. If you're driving down the highway at night, and <clears throat> suddenly you see a flashing sign saying, be careful, there's a hole in the road. And if you don't like that thing that is flashing that there's a hole in the road, and you cover it with a sack, it doesn't stop you from, from uh, crashing into the hole in the road. Because the flashing light is a marker of the hole in the road. It isn't the hole in the road. That's triglycerides, folks. Triglycerides are a marker. They're a warning signal. Elevated triglycerides are a warning signal by your body that there are holes in your blood vessels. But fixing the marker doesn't fix the holes in the blood vessels and therefore will not fix this epidemic of cardiovascular disease and stroke. By the way, cardiovascular disease is the number one killer of people in the United States of America. Okay? So it's a massive, massive genocide. And I call it a genocide because it is something, it is information that is either not figured out at best or more likely being hidden away so that they can sell a drug. They're doing it with statins. They're going to do it with the anti-triglyceride drugs. Because here's the issue, folks. And there's been evidence and proof of this from a guy called Goffman, a, a wonderful lipidologist who was working in the 1950s, who clearly demonstrated the link between triglycerides and cardiovascular disease. And yet he was just swept aside by this tsunami of anti-LDL information and misinformation because we didn't have a drug to treat triglycerides so who the hell cares about them let's focus on ldl because we've got all these statins now we have drugs to treat triglycerides and i bet you goffman's work is going to come back up to the fore but let's take this back a step where do, what are triglycerides and where do they come from triglycerides are, are interesting they're a, a whole host of fatty acids linked together so what you've got is you've got fatty acids, and fatty acids are a bunch of carbon molecules strung together. And they can start as relatively short chains. Remember, a ketone, uh, uh, two carbon molecules, is one of the shortest fatty acids. 
but then they grow. They add more carbons along that chain. And typically, once you get to about 16 carbons in a row, that's called palmitic acid. And I'll come back to palmitic acid in a little bit. And then you add more carbon molecules, and those are uh, uh, fatty acids. <clears throat> now, if you develop another molecule called glycerol, glycerol is a backbone of fat, uh, of fat and it attaches to three triglycerides. Tri meaning three. So you've got three fatty acids that attach to those that glycerol backbone, and that is the way your body transports fatty acids in the body. body. Now, what are the value of fatty acids? Two major values, although they're, they're a variety, two dominant ones. Number one is a fuel source. Anybody in ketosis is basically living off fatty acids. When fatty acids get broken down, they get broken down to ketones, which is the source of fuel that your cells use, as opposed to glucose, to generate energy. And obviously, if you're, if you're ketogenic, we know about ketones. So triglycerides are the way that the human body transports fat around the body, from the liver to the fat cells, and then distributes it to all the other cells as a fuel source. Now, the other use of those triglycerides is every cell membrane, every organelle, the wall or the, the membrane itself, is made of something called phospholipids. It's a phosphate molecule with two fatty acid chains. Instead of three, it's now two fatty acid chains attached to it, and the entirety of the membrane of every cell is made of these phospholipids. So the triglycerides get transported to the cells where they can rebuild them into phospholipids. Phospholipids also get transported to cells, and they develop structural membranes of the organelles and of the cell membrane out of these phospholipids. I'm simplifying it, but that's the way it works. Same product. And there are certain triglycerides or certain fatty acids that are best used in cell membranes and certain that are best used as a fuel source. The fuel sources are pretty basic. Your palmitic, your oleic acids, they're pretty basic as a fuel source. The more complex ones can be used structurally as well as a fuel source. And there are, most fatty acids can be made internally in the body by the liver, by the fat cells, and even by the cells themselves. For example, the brain cells are pretty adept at making them from ketones. Ketones, remember that? Um, so when it comes to these fatty acids, there are two fatty acids that are critically important to cell structure that are called essential fatty acids. We have to eat them because we can't make them in our bodies. And those are three and six omega fatty acids. And one of those fatty acids is called EPA, it's an icosanoid, um, and it is one of the two, DHA and EPA are the two dominant um, fatty acids that are essential. What they've been able to find, these pharmacists and, and the pharmaceutical companies, is that EPA lowers triglycerides. We're not quite sure of the mechanism, at least I haven't been able to find data on the mechanism of this, and I'll explore that in a second. But they've been able to attach EPA to an alcohol, ethyl alcohol, and they call that drug now Vicepa, and they sell it in very high quantities to lower triglycerides. Okay, so they're lowering triglycerides. Wonderful, my triglyceride number is down. When the doctor does the blood work, oh, big smiles, the triglyceride number has shifted from the red to the green. Vicepa's working beautifully. You've put a cloth over the blaring marker light that says there's a hole in the road. You've done diddly squat to fix the hole in the road, and that is your heart attack, folks. So artificially lowering triglycerides with drugs like niacin, like uh, um, uh, ethyl EPA or Vicepa, like the phenofibrates, is not fixing the problem. It is just fixing the marker of a problem. But they're going to push this very heavily, and it's going to take 5, 10, 15 years before we realize, oops, we've been conned again. Just like all the people out there vaping saying, ha, 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 it's safer than smoking, because those very friendly, nice people at the tobacco company said that vaping is safer, they're all going to die of heart attacks and strokes in 20 years' time. Why? Because there are two major molecules that cause holes in your blood vessels, that cause the hole in the road. And one of them is nicotine, folks. One of them is nicotine. I'm going to do a whole subset on smoking and nicotine in a little bit. But nicotine is one of the holes, or one of the, one of the drugs that causes holes in blood vessels. That's the first thing. Okay? The other molecule 
that causes holes in blood vessels, folks. Sugar, glucose, carbohydrates. That is the hole in the road. And chronic excessive carbohydrate consumption, just like chronic excessive nicotine consumption, causes holes in the road. Now, let's focus exclusively on carbohydrates. The human body is not designed to consume a ton of carbohydrates. Yes, we need sugar in our bloodstream as a fuel source, um, as a source of, of um, certain structural elements in the bloodstream, but blood sugar is demand-driven. In other words, when cells require sugar, the blood should, should um, supply that demand, but the demand is driven at a cellular level, and the place where the sugar should come from is your liver. Now, when you start putting a bunch of sugar into your face, now you become not demand-driven, but supply-driven. And that sugar enters the bloodstream and your blood sugar raises. That's toxic to the blood vessels. It damages the red blood cells, that's your A1C. It damages the um, cells that line the endothelial cells that line those vascular, uh, the, the, every blood vessel. It swells them, it causes hypertension. It also damages those cells and causes them to break apart and leave little spaces in between. So that is not a good place. It's not a good thing for the body. And the body recognizes that. It's very smart, this body of ours. Uh, God and nature did, did some phenomenal work before we messed with them. Um, be that as it may, what happens is that elevated blood sugar, the body knows, dudes, this is not good. So it uses a hormone called insulin. Okay? Insulin-driven receptors, as well as non-insulin-driven rece uh, receptors, to Get that sugar out of the bloodstream quickly. Get out of here. Get out of here. Get out of here. The problem is that sugar is toxic in the blood vessels, but it's also toxic inside the cell. So when the cellular uh, um, sugar concentration goes up, it is toxic. Think of the cell as being a separate life, as, as a completely self-contained little animal. Every cell in your body. So when the sugar pours into there, just like with your body, it is toxic. And the way that the, uh, your cells... For the most part, most cells can do this, defend themselves, protect themselves by, from the damage of sugar. They store a little bit as glycogen, which is this uh, starch that gets stored in the cells where it's inert. It's not as toxic as the sugar, but particularly in the liver. The liver is like a sponge. It sucks up all the sugar and very rapidly turns it into fat. Okay, so the liver is very, very good at turning sugar into fat. And the type of fat that the liver produces is something called palmitic acid, a 16-carbon saturated fat. Saturated fat. So it produces the 16-carbon saturated fat, and it's a short molecule. And inside that liver cell, it, the liver cell also produces glycerol, and you get your three fatty acids, typically palmitic acid, maybe oleic acid, which is a 16 and an 18 form, plugging in and creating a triglyceride, a very short-chain triglyceride. And then the liver says, okay, I've got to get these guys out because I've got incoming. I've got incoming. Get the conveyor belt moving. Now, the liver will fatten up. That's a fatty liver that comes from the conversion of sugar to fat. But that fat is not stored in the human liver. Sharks can store fat. Humans can't. So we've got to ship it out. And because those molecules are fairly short, they are soluble in the blood by themselves. They combine with a protein product called globulin, and that globulin tri short-chain triglyceride molecule can float free in the bloodstream, and it'll travel to the fat cells and where it gets stored, and it travels to the other cells. And folks, when your liver is coping with all the sugar and the starch you're stuffing in your face, and rapidly protecting itself by turning them into fat and producing triglycerides that are now free in the bloodstream, that's how your triglyceride number goes up. Triglycerides are go up when the body is trying to defend itself from the toxicity of sugar, of glucose. So now you go and kill the darn triglycerides, you got all the sugar building up, you got all these triglycerides building up in your liver, toxic, toxic, toxic. Not only that, the sugar is building up in the blood vessels. And remember folks, what sugar does in the blood vessels, 
is it swells up the endothelial cells. In fact, sugar can enter endothelial cells, the cells that line the blood vessels, without the use of insulin. The receptor doesn't require insulin. So what happens is that sugar rapidly gets into these cells, they swell up, and the fried egg turns into a round boiled egg, and it leaves little gaps in between these cells. And <laughs> those vessels don't like those gaps. It likes a nice smooth surface. So now you've got these gaps here that attracts the clotting, uh, uh, the clotting mechanism. Because to seal up those holes in the blood vessels, think of me punching a hole in my wall. Well, you come along with some spackle and, sheet and, and seal that up. The first thing that happens is you get a fibrin clot. You get an activation of the intrinsic clotting mechanism. That's how the body protects itself, damage to those blood vessels caused by sugar. And it forms this little fibrin clot, and the fibrin clot activates platelets. If, it, if the cells, if those, liver, if those uh, um, endothelial cells don't straighten out and close up that clot where it gets broken down and off the clot goes and it's, it's dissolved, if that clot stays because the injury stays, now you get platelets that become activated. That was my PhD, folks. My PhD was looking at platelet activation in the clots caused by sugar in the blood vessels. So after five years in the lab, I know a thing or two about this. I've seen it on, under the microscope. I have done that to blood vessels and proven that. So this is proof beyond a doubt. So um, you get the platelets going in, and then a friend of mine, Pierre Clavien, um, and Claire Holloway were also in the lab with me, and they looked at white cells. And platelets rec recruit leukocytes into that thrombus, and now you're getting an organized thrombus. That is an inflammatory response, folks. And sometimes that clot goes away. When you turn down the sugar, that clot goes away, the endothelial cells get better, end of story. But if you keep the sugar going, and you've got blood floating around, now what's being deposited there is fat. And the molecule that brings that fat in to kind of smooth it over, okay, think of spackle on a hole in the wall, is LDL. And the protein that anchors that fat in that thrombus is lipoprotein B100, which is very, very rich in a particular lipoprotein. I'm going to explain lipoproteins in a second. Which lipoprotein? LDL. So LDL is typically a transport molecule that transports long-chain fatty acids, which cannot dissolve easily in the bloodstream by itself, like the short-chain triglycerides, the palmitic acids that come from sugar. So these longer-chain fatty acids, whether they're monosaturated, unsaturated, or saturated, the long chains, which can't float easily in water because, you know, fat doesn't like water, they get packaged in these molecules, uh, VLDL, IDL, and LDL, which is the most stable form, and they just get transported between the liver and the fat cells. That's what LDL does. It's a transport molecule for long-chain fatty acids. But it has a secondary function. It is part of the inflammatory cascade. It is an inflammation molecule. So when you've got these holes, and they're permanent, you've got this big inflammatory cycle happening, the LDL comes in and it deposits fat, this snot-like substance that we, when we operate on blood vessels as surgeons, when someone has a blowout from an aneurysm, the smoker has a blowout from an aneurysm. That snot is the fat that's been layered and layered and layered. And by the way, calcium is part of that clotting cascade. So you've got this little calcium molecule uh, that is part of it's factor two of the clotting cascade that clots in that in that um, clot. And as it as it grows, now you've got the fat being attracted, and you've got the snotty layer that is smoothing over the blood vessel. So at least blood can flow linearly, or have kind of a bumpy ride, but at least the blood can flow along. Now, sometimes that inflammatory clot ruptures and sends a clump downstream that blocks smaller blood vessels. Boom, there's your heart attack, there's your stroke. Okay, so LDL didn't cause that. That was caused by sugar. LDL was just responding. That's how LDL got maligned. Okay, the causative agent to that injury is sugar, folks. And the elevated triglycerides are just a marker of chronic excessive carbohydrate consumption. Triglycerides, as far as we know, probably don't have a lot to do with the actual uh, um, uh, thrombus. There is a question whether those triglycerides, those free-floating triglycerides, are also part of the inflammatory cascade, attracted perhaps, and this is speculation, I don't have proof of this, but perhaps attracted by the ApoE and the ApoB100 lipoproteins to stick in those clots.
particularly when there's some turbulent flow. So interesting how fat can be a transport molecule of energy and structural fat, but it also has a role in the clotting cascade. But not always. You've got to have a hole to have to plug the hole. No hole, the fat's just traveling back and forth. Now, as that clot modifies, if the injury goes away, <clears throat> along comes another molecule, kind of an empty molecule, called HDL. And HDL starts picking up some of that fat out of the clot. It starts repairing and forming that clot. And the dominant protein in HDL is the ApoA1 lipoprotein. And that's the one that releases the fat, and it's encapsulated. And that is why HDL is so-called protective of heart attacks, because it helps in the late stages to modify that injury, that that inflammatory injury in the blood vessels. Now, LDL is not bad. It just layers the fat on. LD, HDL takes it away. But if you've got these ongoing problems, you've got LDL dominance and HDL is low, and your triglycerides are high if you are a carbohydrate consumer because chronic excessive carbohydrate consumption raises triglycerides. So you see, folks, my prediction is that the drug companies are going to ignore this information. The data's out there. The data's out there, okay? Uh, my PhD is somewhere around here. It's a big book. It's got it in there. But that's just a speck on the butt of this evidence. There's plenty of evidence to support what I'm saying. Starting in the 1950s and 40s, by lipidologists that have been swept aside like uh, um, Dr. Goffman. Nevertheless, now that the drug companies have the sexy drug, and they can demonstrate a lowering triglycerides, that's what they're going to do. And they're going to pitch and sell us hard, 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 and pay off a whole bunch of physicians like they paid off a bunch of physicians. I'm not going to go there. They are going to convince good doctors to use medications to lower triglycerides because they're not going to allow good doctors to understand or explain why they think triglycerides are a problem because triglycerides are not. And that, unfortunately, is going to perpetuate a genocidal wave of misinformation that is going to result in the demise of more millions of Americans and people all over the world because they're going to target with their drugs a marker of a problem, not the problem itself. And here's the issue. There is no drug. There is no drug to treat chronic excessive carbohydrate consumption. I could chop off your hands and sew your mouth closed. But other than that, it is up to you to lower your consumption of carbohydrates, to remove them from your life as best you can. And that is the single most effective way to prevent holes in the road, holes in your blood vessels. And then you don't need to lower your triglycerides because they will automatically lower. The commonest thing that I track, apart from C-peptide and um, insulin, which is insulin resistance, which happens after chronic excessive carbohydrate consumption, is triglyceride count. And we look for a triglyceride count below 75 in someone who's insulin sensitive. I also, at the same time, want to see HDL numbers go above 75. And I don't care what your LDL is. I kind of like an LDL somewhere between 120 and 300, which would give most conventional doctors a heart attack on the spot. Let them have a heart attack on your behalf. But if you really want to know if your keto diet is working, if lowering or removing carbohydrates, your carnivore diet is working by removing carbohydrates, if you want to know that your low triglycerides have resulted in cardiovascular safety. Get a CAC score, a coronary artery calcium score. Remember I said calcium is part of the clotting cascade? Well, you can see that calcium build up in your blood vessels. And if there ain't no calcium, there ain't no uh, vascular damage, your risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular and stroke disease is pretty close to zero. Now, the other causes of this, of course, there are. There are emboli, there are other thrombuses. If someone's had an operation, they can clot in their legs. They can throw a pulmonary embolus. They can throw blood clots across the heart. There are other sources of blood clots that are not just carbohydrate-induced. 
but by far the commonest cause of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease is carbohydrates and now in second place but trying to catch up again through vaping is nicotine please 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 folks i know that these are horrible words but this is a horrible horrible epidemic of unnecessary death that puts the heroin crisis that puts the covid crisis it belittles those crises because of the number of people that are going to die every day, every week, every year of strokes and heart attacks. And probably for me, one of the things that convinces me to follow a ketogenic lifestyle, because it sucks, I can't eat my, my drugs, carbohydrates, it's miserable. I want my carbs, although not anymore. But the reason I've chosen to live a ketogenic lifestyle is not because I fear dying. If I die, it's somebody else's problem. I fear half dying. I fear a stroke. I fear that heart attack where I can't do what I do. I've got a five, a seven-day-old baby right now. And I'm an old man. I owe it to that baby to stay alive. Don't you owe it to yourself not to half die. Don't you owe it to the people around you to stay healthy. Don't fall for the next big pharmaceutical con. Don't be part of the next genocidal wave of cardiovascular drugs. Get rid of the sugar and starch in your life. Follow a ketogenic diet. Follow a carnivore diet if you want to. Stay low carb. Don't smoke. Don't use nicotine products. And you will be better than the drug companies can ever make you. I hope my words weren't too harsh, but you know what? No apologies. Because I never want to tell another patient, although it's going to happen probably tomorrow or the next day, I'm so sorry for your loss. I'm so sorry for your loss. Your husband, your father, your mother, your wife, your sister, your cousin, your daughter, your son, I am so sorry for your loss. Oh, they didn't come for their appointment? Ah, they're in stroke rehab. Well, wish them well. And when they're better, have them come and see me. Kind of too late. Oh, they're in cardiovascular rehab. They really want to change now. Do it up front, folks. You owe it to yourself. You owe it to your relatives. Get rid of the sugar and the starch. Treat the root cause. Not what the money-making pharmaceutical companies would have you believe.